So my talk is uh, divided into roughly two halves. So I will give a very long introduction and mostly non-technical. And, uh, and then I will give some more technical details on how to show actually the things. OK, so, so recently uh, we made some conjecture based on a lot of earlier work. So that um, if you take string theory on uh, ADS3, S3, T4 background, so that's the background I will focus on in this talk. And uh, I take it with exactly one unit of an SNS flux and no unit of RR flux. So it's not immediately, it's not very obvious how you make sense of this theory actually. But uh, there is some way of making sense of it. And, uh, but in this talk, I will mostly get around uh, this difficulty. And uh, the claim is that there is an exact holographic dual of it, which is the symmetric product orbifold of T4. So the, the upgrade with respect to earlier statements is that now there is an equal sign here, not only uh, on the same modular space, modular space sign. So both of these sides have very large modular spaces. And a priori, it's not obvious how. Uh, so these are special points in the modular space. And the claim is that these special points are dual to each other. And that is a very nice uh, statement, if it's true, because uh, we can solve this theory in principle exactly. And we also hope to solve this theory exactly. Sorry, on the right hand side, by modular space, you mean marginal operators? That's right, yeah. So I could deform away. So the symmetric product orbifold. Maybe I should also write what I might mean by that exactly. So I mean n copies of uh, the four torus as target space, and I divide out by the symmetric group. And the twisted sector of that orbifold has a marginal operator, and I can deform by that operator to go away from the symmetric product orbifold point. Can you imagine, uh, what is the twist field exactly marginal that we in the in the bulk? It corresponds to putting some. RR flux on the tor torus, basically. So today so you are not going to turn on RR. No, I will not. I will stick at this uh, to this point in the modular space. So then on the right hand side, we will stick to this product. That's right. Yeah. And uh, so I should also stress that this uh, duality should be understood as a perturbative duality. Till now, I cannot say anything non perturbative, and I mean perturbative in G string. So G string should be identified with 1 over square root n. And um, so for actually in this talk, I will only stick to the sphere contribution on both sides. So, um, so there is some way of genus expansion as a symmetric product, which we will see later also. So there's a genus expansion here, and it should correspond to the genus expansion in, this, uh, in the string theory. So the main evidence for this statement till now was that the full uh, string spectrum was matched. So and here I mean the one, so this string spectrum is not BPS or anything, it's really full one, but it's exact in alpha prime, but tree level in G string. So this. So that's the main evidence. And uh, what I want to do today is not talk about this, uh, but rather talk about uh, how correlation functions match in this correspondence and give some more structural reason why so something like that should be true, instead of just accumulating evidence for it. Sorry, one more nice question. So there's just one marginal operator, or there are many? There are four. So uh, in principle, there are like 16 trivial ones, which just deform the shape of the torus. And then there are four more coming from the twisted sector. So that's what I mean by large modular space. Um, good. So let's uh, look at correlation function. So let's try to compute a correlation function on both sides. So if I were to compute a correlation function in the symmetric product orbifold, so I will have some operator O's. And they will have some labels, which I will call W. And uh, 
these will be twisted sector labels. So they la label the twisted sector in which this field lives. And I take n of them. OK, and uh, there is some sense in which I can look at some genus contribution, which hopefully I will explain in a minute. And uh, then we would hope that this is due to a collation function in ADS. So uh, let's compute the collation function in string theory. What I should do is to uh, take the corresponding vertex operator that is due to that one. So we'll call it uh, V. And it will also depend on some similar quantum number, W. Uh, I also often add the label H, which will be the conformal weight in the dual CFT. And this vertex operator will now depend on some uh, auxiliary variable from the world sheet point of view, auxiliary variable x, which will be identified with the x insertion of the operator in the dual CFT. And moreover, it also depends on the world sheet coordinate, which I will call z. So maybe I should uh, make like a. So z will always be the world sheet coordinate, and x will be the dual CFT coordinate. So from the world sheet, this x is just an auxiliary coordinate. It's, so the world sheet theory has an SL2R, global SL2R symmetry. And I can have this x transforms under Möbius transformation under it. So that's what is the meaning of x in the world sheet. And I will also have n of them here. OK, and since this is string theory, so I'm a bit schematic here, uh, I should integrate over the modular space of Riemann surfaces. OK, so maybe I say first uh, something more about the WIs. So the WIs on the CFT side, I'm taking a symmetric product orbifold. So I'm taking an orbifold with this symmetric group. So in any orbifold, twisted sectors are labeled by conjugacy class of the, of the orbifold group. And for the symmetric group, conjugacy classes are given by their cycle types. So uh, in principle, I should put here any cycle type. However, uh, in this correspondence, I'm actually matching only the single particle sector. So uh, the symmetric product orbifold is describing single string configuration as well as multi-string configurations. And how the correspondence is going is just that if you have a single cycle, uh, this will correspond to a single string. So what this W here actually is, is a uh, shorthand for the conjugacy class of a single cycle of length w. And on the string side, uh, the w, which is also present here, is corresponding to some winding number. So in ADS3, a string can wind around uh, the boundary of ADS3 w times. And that's what this w means. More algebraically, it will correspond to the spectral flow of the particular vertex operator. It lives in some representation, which has some spectral flow number w. OK, so these are hopefully now all the quantum numbers are clear. No, it's not really. It's not a symmetry. It's not a symmetry. Okay. I mean, there, so the, the SL2R affine algebra has an outer automorphism. And, uh, and I take w, so I take some representation and compose it with this outer automorphism w times that will. So my question is really whether these operators are completely well defined by specifying w, or does it mix with other operators? Uh, I think it's well def it's, it's just some represent. So w is a label of the representation, so it's, it's completely well defined. But we will come to. to The global SL2R representation, yes. Not the affine one. Okay. Not the affine one. But we will come later to the form of the vertex operator. Maybe you can ask your question again. Um, sorry, say again. Uh, good. So not in this X basis, because in the X basis, you can do a global transformation. If you send X to minus 1 over X, you will reverse the, uh, the direction of w. So it, I, I will only have positive w's because of that. 
That's right. But it's so, so you're probably used to thinking about in the basis where I diagonalize the, 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 three, the J3 generator of SL2R. And in this basis, uh, my W can be both positive and negative. However, when I go to this X basis, because I can do these global transformations, which I couldn't do before, I can send actually W to minus W. So with lo without loss of generality, you can restrict to positive Ws. That's right. And if you look from the other side of the sphere, basically it's in the, in the other direction. Uh, it's always well defined, but geometrically, you would say it's well. I mean, there's a clear geometric picture if the string is big. So, I mean, uh, the string, like if I draw ADS3, so I will focus only on continuous representation. So, so the string comes in to ADS3 and goes out again to the boundary. So, in asymptotically, it's always well defined. Here in the middle, it's less clear. OK, um, good. So let me maybe, before going on here, explain you what, uh, how this genus expansion goes in the symmetric product orbifold. So in general, if I have some twist field, so in my orbifold I will have some field that's called x, some generic field, and it lives in the copy i of this uh, n copies of t4. And I place my twist field here, and let me check. So I can choose a specific representative of this conjugacy class. And the actual twist field I will get by summing over all representatives. So that's the gauge invariant quantity that's SN gauge dependent. So if I have the twist field here, let's put it at some point, x1, and this at x, then by definition, if I go around with this field, I pick up some monodromy. And the resulting field is uh, x, but now I have to transform the index i uh, with the group element g. OK, so you see that if in the presence of these twist fields, uh, the fundamental fields of my symmetric product orbifold are no longer single value. Because if I go around, I will have some monodromy. So now I can always uh, trade this monodromy. So these monodromies, they will define me some Riemann surface over the base space. So the CFT, the x, lives on S2. And I can always trade this monodromy for some Riemann surface over this S2. So, um, so this, these monodromies define a map from some Riemann surface of some genus. And it has n punctures if I insert n of these twist fields to the original S2, I guess also with n punctures, where I have my twist fields inserted. And this uh, we'll also always call this covering map. This is a branch covering map. We will always call big gamma. So what does it mean to be a branch covering map? So it means that if I look at the inverse of gamma, th the inverse of gamma should exactly implement these monodromies around the twist fields. So if you translate this and how the gamma should look like, should have the correct ramification indices. And that means if I um, do an expansion of gamma in the vicinity of the zi. First of all, I want to map so these uh, twist fields in the covering map. They are at some new positions, zi. And the zi should be mapped to xi. And then the requirement that the inverse should have this monodromy of order w around it means that the first non-vanishing term in this expansion is of order w. OK, and then there will be higher terms. In the figure, you wrote g on top uh, as a superscript of the O. G yes, g is a representative of the conjugacy class de defined by the cycle length w. So it's a specific representative. But in principle, you have to sum over all of them. That also means the many sigma g ions. That's right. That's right. So, and that g is the same as the g in the upper equation, or not? That's, yes, okay. exactly. The, so that would be my next point. And you might also have noticed that I already broke my promise to call z on the world sheet coordinates. So uh, I will also call the covering space coordinates z. 
And uh, so Z lives now in some Riemann surface. And here on the worksheet, I have computed my correlator on some Riemann surface. And the main claim or wish, let's, let's call it main hope, um, is that these are actually the same ones. So the, the covering one is the, is the string. So in particular, this means also that the genus is the same. So that's the genus expansion, the symmetric product orbifold. And we would like to identify this covering map directly with the world sheet. So that would be uh, the incarnation of ADS CFT. OK. Um, so let's see a bit more how we. Aren't you integrating over the sigma GM on the right side? Sorry, say, say again. Aren't you integrating over the sigma GM on the right side? Yes, so that, that uh, will come in a moment. So let's stick a bit more with the symmetric product. Yes. Is actually a sum of the contributions of different sigma GM. Yes. So the, the, the line with the sub G means you take the, the part of it that comes from the carbon Z. Yes. So that's right. So so here in like stand so here this is a big sum over all the representatives, but it's equivalent to say a sum over the representatives or a sum over all covering maps. So summing over all branch covering maps exactly implements me this uh, gauge invariance, SM gauge invariance. Um, good. So let's see. Let's take again this correlator. And we said we can lift it to the covering space. So let's lift it to the and let's lift it to the covering space, and we will have a sum over different covering space, as Edward just said. We should uh, sum over all possible branch coverings which corresponds to taking all the summing over all the representatives of the twist fields. So here we'll have a sum over all gamma branch coverings. And here I should now compute the correlator in the covering space. So I will have some transform field, which has no longer monodromy, so I don't put any uh, W label anymore. It lives now in the covering space. Like that, and because I, if I, I just did a very complicated uh, conformal transformation, so because of that, I have here a conformal factor, which is given by the Liouville action of the Weyl factor associated to this conformal transformation. So e to the phi here is the derivative of the covering map squared. Okay, so that's in principle. And by, by going to these covering maps, I get rid of my, of my twists. So I undid the twists here. So these are just regular correlation functions. But the price I have to pay is that this is defined on some higher Riemann surface. So I can always uh, trade my, um, my correlation function in the base space for a correlation function in the covering space like that. And for the, in the following, I will mostly uh, focus on the twisted sector ground states. So if these are twisted, which means these are the pure twist states, and if I lift them to the covering space, they just become the identity field in the covering space because they no longer implement twists. So actually, I will mostly forget about this and just compute the partition function in the covering space. Um, in this context, not at all, because the excited states, you can always uh, bounce back to the to the twisted sector ground states because you have a large enough symmetry algebra essentially. Okay, I don't know. You can put momentum and winding on T4, which strictly speaking. Is so the, the Zs? The Zs? You, you mean these Zs? These are just coordinates in the covering space here. But it's the same as the Zs up here? On the right hand side? Yeah. Uh, that's my goal to show that essentially. So so I want that this is identified under ADS CFT with the um, with the world sheet, and I'm setting up the notation for that. But till now, that's just my hope that these will be the same. So if I specify, let's just do an example of the covering map, maybe. So for instance, if I take four of the, let's specify four x's. So I can always specify three like that, and the fourth one is unspecified. That's whatever it is, and. 
Now you want to find the covering space. So let's uh, choose a simple example. Let's take w1 equal to 2, w2 equal to 1. So it's a maybe stupid example, but maybe it helps. And w4 is also 1. So it's an example I can do. And on the covering space, the covering space in this case will still be a sphere. And um, so I can choose also for the sphere, I can choose three coordinates. And the fourth one is unspecified. And already by choosing the three coordinates, I have specified my covering map uniquely, because the unique map that satisfies the criterion that the expansion is like that is actually z squared. So because I need to satisfy that around 0, 0 is supposed to be mapped to 0, then the next term in the exp expansion is missing. Uh, and then there is a square term. 0 is mapped to 0, 1 is mapped to 1, infinity is mapped to infinity. But now it's specified what z4 is mapped to. So gamma of z4 is x4. So I can view z4 just be as a function of, of x4. So here I write z. But implicitly, by, by giving this covering map, I always know that it's a function of the axis. OK, does this make sense? No, no, it's not. Yes. In even twisted sectors, yes, because the fermions are Raman sector moded. Is that what you're referring to? Um, yes. So that's true. So maybe let's restrict for simplicity to odd. Um, I mean, I, I will not bother much with this detail. Yeah. OK, and also for future reference, let me write down what the sleeveable action is. So it just depends on the central charge. And then I have to evaluate it on the covering space. And I evaluate this factor on the covering space. There's a 2. Like that. OK, so now there is an. So let's go back to this identification. So we want to identify the left-hand side with the right-hand side. And we just saw that we can rewrite the left-hand side in that way. So uh, obviously, there is a big mismatch. So because we have on the string side, we are integrating over the model space of the correlators on the world sheet, and so on. And we want to identify this with a sum over branch covers. And here I get the level action, this phi, and then I have the correlator on the covering space. So the two sides look in some sense similar, because I have on both sides, I'm taking a correlator on the Riemann surface. But the most glaring difference is that on the string side, I'm taking an integral. On the CFT side, I'm taking a finite sum. So um, the most elegant resolution of that was already suggested um, by Rastelli, Pakman, and uh, Razamat. I think it's 0, 7, 7. And what they suggested is that the string modular space integral should actually be localized. And it should localize on all uh, configurations given by branched coverings. So this integral localizes. OK, and uh, so here it's important, again, to understand what it means, all configurations specified by branch coverings. So in general, in this problem, I give as inputs all the x's, I give all the z's, and I give the genus. I give the, the specific, the modulus, the moduli of the Riemann surfaces. And in general, the, you will not find a covering map from the, the, the Riemann surface to the base space satisfying all these requirements. We just saw in this simple example that in the case of if the, the z space and the x space is both a sphere and you take a four point function, in general you have to satisfy one relation, something like that, in order for you to be able to find such a covering map. Okay, and in, in general you, you have to find exactly 3G 
minus 3 plus unre n relations in order for you to be able to find such a covering map. So if, if you give all the x's, then the z's and the moduli of the Riemann surface are already determined, or there are finitely many choices for it. So this is really a complete localization, this condition. Okay? Good. So, and however, this at the time was a complete conjecture. So now at least we can uh, give very strong evidence that this is true for the genus zero. And I'm working on the higher genus, but it's a bit painful. Wait, so uh, this localization is happening for just the P4 theory, or? Uh, or just the uh, one unit of an SNX structure. Yeah. So there's some slight generalization we will see. Um, OK, so, so the, what I will do mainly in the second part of the talk is to show you how, how this works for genus zero. OK, so that was this. So, and then we can go on. If we look further at this expression, now this will be the mechanism uh, by which this integral will be turned into a sum. Then, of course, there's still a difference. Here, you're still computing an endpoint function. And here, you're computing a correlation function with some exponential factor in front. And what would be very nice is to interpret this actually as the on-shell action of the classical solution corresponding to this correlator. So this looks exactly like an on-shell action contribution. So let's look at the uh, classical action on ADS3. looks like this. I'm focusing only on the ADS3 part because I will implicitly always assume all the other parts to be in the vacuum configuration because we, we here we restrict it to primary fields at some point here. We forgot about them. So I will only focus on the ADS3 part. And uh, I will also, since now I'm doing semi-classical, there will be only the bosonic part of the action. So one way of writing the action is like that. This was pioneered long ago by Nati, Kivion and Kutasov. And um, so here in this, in this parameterization of the action, I have one complex field, namely gamma, and uh, the complex conjugate gamma bar. And you should think of gamma and gamma bar as parameterizing the boundary sphere of ADS3. And then we have a third variable, a real field, phi. And phi, you should think of as being the radial direction. direction. And the boundary is at uh, phi to infinity. Right. So this last term is uh, generated at the quantum level. So that's generated through renormalization at the quantum level. Uh, not yet, I will put it. So uh, if I put k to 1 at this point, it wouldn't make any sense because I'm talking in semi-classical. So for now, I'm not putting k to 1, and but there's a sense in which we can go to k to 1. OK, so um, as you can see, if I near the boundary, this action actually becomes quite uh, bad because there's this exponential div divergence. But what you can do is just to identify uh, to introduce an auxiliary field. So I have to write it again. So I now introduce this field beta and beta bar. And then this becomes minus e to the this and minus. And you can just integrate out beta again, and you would get back to the original action. And in this form, you see that the boundary is mu much nicer behaving. So if phi goes to infinity, this term would dis disappear near phi to infinity. And actually, why am I so focused on phi to infinity? Because um, what will actually happen is that we find 
uh, holo so from this action is not at all obvious that I mean, these give quite ugly equations of motion and it's not obvious how to find nice solutions of them and so we will see in the later analysis that the solutions we find have the property for cake to one that gamma is holomorphic holomorphic and phi is the sum of holomorphic and anti-holomorphic so what this mo should mean is that the phi has actually is very close to the boundary because the only way this is consistent with this action is if phi is very close to the boundary and this ugly mixed term is not there so because of this I want to argue that phi is pinned to the boundary So all the solutions for cake to one you can find, and you can identify these fields also in the in the quantum theory, have this property that they're holomorphic, and phi is sum of holomorphic and anti-holomorphic. So they have all an infinite additive constant in this phi. And they're very close to the boundary, and if they're close to the boundary, you can forget about this term. And also, if you're close to the boundary, actually now it would make sense to talk semi-classically also about cake to one, because if this term is not there, it becomes quadratic. So the semi-classical answer becomes exact. So that's what I want to argue. Ah, that's for later. So, um, <coughs> okay. So. Actually, we can have a semi-classically exact answer. And now I want you to look a bit more at this action. So if I have a gamma holomorphic and phi sum of holomorphic and anti-holomorphic, and we said we want to interpret this as the on-shell action, then this becomes actually quite nice, because if we're holomorphic and anti-holomorphic, these two terms die. Because um, so you see that actually what remains exactly looks like a Liouville action. And the solution we find uh, is ex actually that e to the minus 2 phi will be this. So that's sum of holomorphic and anti-holomorphic. So you see it's essentially just the little phi. Now there's times a constant. So this is this infinite constant that we're close to the boundary. But so you see that from this, it just follows that the big phi I want to identify with, um, I guess, minus a half small phi, something like that, plus a constant. This, uh, no. But so be, be a bit patient, please, and uh, you will see. Yeah. So, so we will see this later. And if you believe this for now, then, um, then we should have this identification. And you see that the on-shell action now of the left-hand side just becomes this uh, Liouville term on the right-hand side. So this is, we think, the mechanism by which the two sides can become equal. So there are many, many issues we still don't know. For instance, uh, from this localization in principle, you could think that you pick up some, uh, some Jacobian in the localization locus. So it doesn't seem to be there. So it just already matches. But you could argue that uh, we haven't taken care of this, and this is true. So this is. There's still some parts we don't understand. But this, we think, is the rough mechanism by which it could work. OK, so this was the first part. Yes? Yes? This one? Yes, ah, yes. Uh, maybe I shouldn't write it at the classical level. Right, yeah, that's true. Yeah, okay, so let's, let's don't write it here. Okay, um, good. So.
Okay. So let's talk a bit more about, uh, since the dual CFT is quite standard and was already solved long ago, I will mostly focus on the world sheet part because that's where the interesting Can stuff is happening. Comment yes. on the relation between the semi-classical analysis you did there and the k equals 1 limit? You just expect it will hold all the way down? Or right, because, uh, because in close to the boundary, this ugly term disappears, this e to the minus 2 phi beta beta bar. So then the action is quadratic if you're in this regime near the boundary. And uh, so I will expect that actually the, the semi-classical answer can hold even at k to 1. And what is putting us close to the boundary? That uh, is, we see that the solutions we will see in a moment is that gamma is holomorphic and uh, phi is holomorphic plus anti-holomorphic. And if you look at the equations of motions, there's something like this. Uh, there might be some factors wrong. But uh, so essentially now, by the equations of motion, you see that this part has to disappear. So that's what's putting you at the bound. But the actual solution doesn't work like e to the minus 5 over k. It has to be something. This one? Yeah. yeah, but this constant is an infinite constant. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I want to argue. So the, the solution I find is always that phi is holomorphic plus anti-holomorphic. So I, I actually cannot show you that it's big. I can just show you that it's holomorphic plus anti-holomorphic. But the only way this is compatible with the semi-classical analysis is if I'm sitting close to the boundary. That's right. Yes, that's right. Well, so we're not really near the boundary. So, so, sorry, we don't? We're, we don't seem to really be near the boundary. The solution you wrote turns to phi is more than one. No, this constant here is infinite. So this gives you an infinite shift in phi. Okay. It's a multiplicative constant? It's a multi, yeah, that's a time series. Sorry, you'd say? So, so you have a time gap solution. Right. Right. So, but it wouldn't matter, right? In this, I mean, if I, if I put an additive constant to phi, I don't see it in the on shell action. Yeah, yeah, it's not. The action is constant. Yeah. But uh, when we integrate over it, it's. Uh, yeah, classically, that might be the correct interpretation. Is beta zero in the solution? No. It's something quite complicated. I'm very fast. Yes. Imagine I'm in a position like this, obviously. Right. I plot this correlation function with this edge, and you'll get a function with some finite size. In, in general, yes. In, right. In general, yes. Yes. I'm near the boundary. If I, if I'm looking at this uh, cake to one theory in the quantum theory, which I can do, uh, then I can show you that the only solutions there are in the quantum theory. So what I will do is to evaluate this correlator uh, times the VVV. So and this will be a holomorphic uh, function in Z. Yeah, but I think if, if you're not going to cake to one, then there's no sense in this blackboard. Not, not much, at least. That makes, so there are two, two regimes in which this classical action makes sense, either for large K or for large phi. Yeah, I mean. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. But if you go to the quantum level for small k, k, you will have a very. I mean, this this will be a very bad approximation if you make computations semi-classical. Yeah. This is a study point. Yeah. This is a study point for any k. So you don't even need to say that the phi is zero. Yes. Right. 
one might be a special form of speech. Yes. In what sense is finding the boundary? I mean, if I find only in the in the quantum theory, I can show you this that this phi is holomorphic, or holomorphic plus anti-holomorphic. And in this sense. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think here, maybe what you can say is that this is calculating infinite parts of the answer. So uh, you have the zero mode and so on. Yes. So the infinite parts only to those special values of C, not to generic C. Right, right. So yeah. generic C, the answer is, is finite. So those special values of C, the answer is infinite. And the free factor of infinity is just this token. Yeah. 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 The, yeah, yeah. Um, OK. Good. So let me uh, give some more details about the vertex operators I'm actually talking about. So this V's, and I write now straight V's instead of curly V's because I'm stripping off the ghost. So I'm only talking this SL2R Westermin-Witt model. And for now, I don't put the label. So the label will come back in a second. So I just have two X. I have now X and Z. So I should you define you what they mean. And I have now two translation generators. So I have uh, the usual L minus 1. But I have a second one because I have a second SL2R. So, and I can just move around my vertex operators by applying both translation generators. So maybe I should write you down also the full algebra. So, So this is the symmetry algebra I'm talking about. OK. And uh, so these vertex operators, they are primary with respect to SL2R. So if I write down in this uh, x basis the defining relations, then they should have all simple poles with the currents. So I have the J plus current. If I take OPE with this, then it should have first order pole. And the plus acts as translation generator. So what's written here is the derivative. And I can do it similarly with the other currents. So it has first order pole, and J3 me measures H. But then there's also contribution because of X translations. And there's an analogous formula just for J minus, and it's just these differential operators, this one. OK. So however, these are not the actual vertex operators I want, because these vertex operators have a conformal weight on the world sheet bigger than 0. So and if the conformal weight on the world sheet is bigger than 0, there's no way I can satisfy the mass share condition in string theory. So these will actually not lead to physical uh, states. So I should also mention here that I'm focusing on SL2R representations, which have uh, SL2R spin, uh, which is in a half plus IS. So I'm uh, not, I'm focusing on the long string sector, because for cake to one, for the minimal amount of NS and S flux, uh, there is just, these are the only states there are. So I'm just looking at them. Sorry? No short, no short strings, right. So because of that, we have to find more vertex operators. And we can do it by this spectral flow. So SL2R has a spectral flow operation, which essentially mixes the, ch the SL2R charge 
with the, the molding. So it mixes the two SL2Rs we have and takes some, defines uh, some new SL2Rs uh, embedded in the old ones. So in the picture, if you would write the corresponding representation here, so let me make a picture of L0, J03 plane. And here, down here, there are the ground state modes. So these are the ones uh, of the primary fields. And I can go here with J0 plus, and I have resumed this direction in the X spaces. So in the X spaces, all these states will become one field. And then I can take affine generators to get descendants with higher informal weights, something like this. So what spectral flow is now do doing is just tilting this picture like that. So in a spectral flow representation, would have something like this as states. Okay, so it's no longer highest weight representation in a strict sense. So I have unbounded energy from below, but at any fixed uh, from at any fixed charge, I have bounded energy. And for instance, I can go from this state to this state by taking the J plus in this example would be two spectral flow two generator down here. But I could also go here spectral flow one generator. The zero modes now actually go in inside the representation. That's what the zero modes are doing. And I still resum my zero modes by in the X spaces. So the X spaces resum some weird horizontal direction now, not this edge of the representation. And um, the spin, so the, the vertex operators, they will still have some spin. And this spin is still uh, characterized by the representation of the, these edge modes. So the modes on the edge here, they form some SL2R representation. And there's some shifted SL2R, something like this. And there's some correction from the zero mode. So the, this, again, forms an SL2R. And these uh, edge modes are a representation of it. And they have some spin J. So secretly, all my vertex operators depend on the spin J. I just don't write it down. OK, so now if you would write down the defining OPEs uh, with such a spectrally float vertex operator, it would like, look like this. So for simplicity, let me put it at zero. You can always put it at some other point again by this. So now J plus will actually have a very, very high order pull with this vertex operator, because even positive modes of J plus don't annihilate it. So in this example, it would have a third order pull. So in general, it has a W plus one order pull. So let me put. And here, I really cannot say much. It's just some state in the, like in the in the middle of the representation. There is no good way of, uh, like, I mean, there is no good name of this. It's just some unknown field. And but the zero mode I still resum with uh, in the X spaces, so the zero mode is still like this. The first order. Point. So the only thing I could maybe say is that the last one. The highest order pull. So this one is actually the one where I shift down here. So it's still a new, it's still a primary state. It's still an affine primary state. So it's actually this guy, where I write h plus 1. And because this has to form an SL2R representation, there is some prefactor associated to it. And I will choose it like this. OK. But all the states in between, I cannot say much this OP. And J3, I mean, there's still only the zero mode is doing something, and all positive modes are doing nothing, or annihilate in this state. So this has just the first order pull. OK, so now it looks like I've made it much more complicated by introducing all these no new poles. But I get also a reward for it, namely that J minus OP is actually much nicer now. Because not only does it annihilate positive J minus modes annihilate, but also some negative J minus modes annihilate. So for instance, here the J minus minus 1 mode gives no state on this affine primary. So what this means is that this has actually not only regular OPE, but very regular OPE. So it has regular OPE up to order W minus 1. So there are, OK? Yeah, so, so I should now put the W here. And That's does H here is the function of the No. H is uh, just the 
h is the direction where h is increasing in this direction. So all the, rep the whole representation has the same j. But if I go down the edge here, I will increase my j, uh, my h. Sorry. Okay. In the dual CFT, right? Because it's the eigenvalue of the j zero three. Um, okay. So the so these are the vertex operators I'm talking about, and now I want to restrict, put restrictions on the correlation functions. Now, how I do it is by computing put Z again, um, a correlator where I insert one of the currents. So I want to compute such a correlate. OK? J plus, yes. Um, and so this seems completely horrible. Um, so usually in like unflowed representations, this will have first order poles. So what you do is just by the water identities, you subtract all the first order poles. And if you know this correlator with of the Vs, you also know this correlate. And here, it seems like it's completely horrible. So the only thing I can really say is that I sum over all the insertions, and I can just sum over all possible poles I have. And they will have very high, high order, z minus zj, something like this. And then I get the fields where I acted on one of these with j plus. OK. So that's really the only thing I can say. The, uh, only the zero mode I can again write as a derivative. And the, the highest mode I could write as the shifted field. But it doesn't help that much. So most of these terms are unknown. However, I could do the same exercise with J3 or with J minus. OK, and uh, actually, if you, if you write it down, it will involve the same unknown constants, these ones. And now you can use your reward here that this OP is very regular, and you can um, impose it. So you have to impose now that J minus with V is very regular. This will give you many equations. And these equations actually fix all of the unknown terms here. So if you use the j minus regularity, then you fix all unknown terms. So by unknown, I mean everything except for the highest one and the zero mode. So these are the ones which are not fixed. OK. So but you can do a bit better. Now we use the regularity. But if you would look at the next term, it the first non-vanishing term here. We can also say something about this, because it's the term where j minus maps us to this state one up. So we could also we also know that j minus the minus w mode now on this is actually the one where I shift down by one. Okay, and here again there's a prefect oh, minus j. Okay, so if you if you look at this term in the in the OP expansion, you cannot compute it either like this, or you can compute it by using this formula, because you know all the unknown terms here. So you have two ways of computing it. And this gives you a relation between different correlators of different ages. OK, so in general, this, this uh, relation, I can derive your Mathematica for arbitrary w and so on, case by case. But I cannot write you down a closed form for what it should be. So I wrote you down the very easiest case, namely the one where all the w's are 1. OK, if all the w's are 1, then actually I don't have to go through this equation solving. And I just have to compare different terms. And also to help me further, I put uh, the x and z's to 0 like this. This just fixes me global asset to R invariance. I, again, if I haven't said so, I want to compute this only on the sphere. So for now, I cannot do any better than the sphere. Um, good, and that's the result. So this gives me some, some relation between the correlators where some edges are shifted down by 1 and some edges are shifted up by 1. So I was too lazy to write the coordinates, but of course they're still there. OK, so this gives uh, now some constraint on the correlators.
Yes. No, because it's only true if I put zero zero here. So if I would put zeta with v h x dot z, then this is not very regular because this j minus always receives contributions from j plus j two. Um, okay, so the main claim now is that uh, these recursion relations. The recursion relations, I mean these equations, which are recursion relations in the H's for the correlators, they are always solved by the following uh, solution. Namely that the correlators, um, there is sum over branch covering maps. And then I have a product over these AI coefficients. And remember, the AI coefficient was the leading term in the covering map expansion. OK, so this is this coefficient. And then we have a product of the delta functions, which imposes that the xi's are equal to the gamma of zi's. So that's the localization constraint in this case. And then there's some unknown functions. The left, we call w, of the z4 up to zn. OK, so this part we cannot fix by this recursion relation. But the claim is that this always satisfies these recursion relations. And that uh, we found is very strong evidence that this is true, this localization, because it gives you, uh, so this gives you a very, this recursion relation for w to 1, it still looks fine. But if you go to higher w, it looks like a complete mess. And there's, yeah, there's one uh, caveat. So, and this is true if, the sum of all the j's, so the j's are the SL2R spins involved here, is k plus 2 half times n minus 2 minus n minus 3. So there um, is this constraint. And this constraint, in general, is not true. And in fact, for k bigger than 1, there's no way of satisfying it within the physical string spectrum. So because if we put j to be half plus an imaginary number, so this this here will have real part only n half, and this will be, if, if k is bigger than 1, will have very large real part. But if k is 1, the right hand side actually simplifies a lot, and this just uh, should just be n half. So if k is 1, this constraint is always satisfied. If k is bigger than 1, it's never satisfied. And moreover, if k is 1, we also know that the only physical states have actually also this s equal to 0. So for k to 1, the only physical states have j to 1 half, and they always satisfy this constraint. OK. So in this case, is it this solved recursion? Right. So let's just. Uh, it's in some cases the only solutions, but in general, it's probably not. So I'm not sure. Uh, so we're not exactly sure. There are more solutions, but they, they have also some sickness to it. I'm not entirely sure what's the right criterion to discard them or not. Yes, that's right. Right. I mean, yeah, but so for k to one, yeah, so it's for k bigger than one, you mo want more than that because the real part there's no way to satisfy this. And for the for k to one, there is no radial momentum. The only states have like zero radial momentum. They're like on the boundary to be long string and short string. No. So let's just check it here. Uh, so if all w's are one. Then there's just one branch covering map. And the unique ca branch covering map is the identity. OK? So uh, since I chose my Möbius invariance like that. So if the covering map is the identity, that also means that all the AIs are 1. So actually, the a this correlator doesn't depend at all on the conformal weight for w equal to 1. And we have this, uh, and there's one delta function in it, which imposes that x4 is z4. OK? And also, sorry, all the higher ones. So x i z i for i bigger equal than 4. And so let's just check it. So what this does is that here, this does not depend on h. So I can forget about this shift. 
here, this will just kill me this x i z i because it multiplies, multiplies this delta function. Um, then there is no two. Sorry. Um, so here, uh, actually, you might think that this vanishes, but because there's x i minus z i and the delta function imposes me to, to be equal. But it actually does not, because there's a derivative of delta function here. And derivative of delta function, you can use this functional identity. This identity is, again, delta function. So this actually gives a constant uh, factor or constant term, which is uh, something like n minus 3. So that's why I wrote the n minus 3 separately, because it comes from this delta prime terms. And then there are these terms. And this, again, disappears because all the xi's are zi's. And then you can check that this is just an algebraic relation, which is now left, and it's this one. OK? And we can actually prove, I, while I cannot write you down the recursion relations for higher w's, I can prove you that it's always a solution of the recursion relations. Um, OK, so I'm almost done. So, um, so this was this localization, how we um, think it's true. And uh, so now we should only uh, get back to this blackboard up there and discuss the, it in, the, in this phi beta gamma realization. And in the quantum theory, we have a free field realization of our current algebra. It looks like this. So j plus, now expressed in terms of these free fields. j plus, j3 is minus. Okay, and um, so we know how to express the currents in terms of these free fields, and uh, ideally we would like to Im to invert this procedure to uh, to express the free fields in terms of the currents, because we know. So I said I want to compute this this correlator up there and show that it's holomorphic in Z. And uh, so if I could invert this, I can just use my result on what, the, what, what is this correlation function of the current. Uh, and while you cannot do this entirely, you can do it sort of order, or, order by order. So for instance, let's try to compute this correlator with small gamma inserted. And the strategy to compute it is just to look at uh, the z near to zi limit. So I want, will expand this around z near to zi. And you can show, since you know the OPEs, sorry, where is it? Up there, of the currents with the vertex operators, you can also deduce what are the OPEs of these free fields with the vertex operators. And for gamma, they take the following form. So this is xi times vhi. So it's actually all regular. And then there's nothing for a long time. And then the first non-vanishing term is z minus zi to the wi, hi wi, xi zi. And then there's even higher order terms, which we don't know. So uh, now this strategy is just to use this OPE. Sorry, and here's h minus 1. And so this means if I expand this around that i, the first term I will get is just x i times the correlator back. Okay. Then the next term I will get is this plus z minus z i to the w i, but it multiplies the correlator where one of the h's, the h i, has been shifted down by one. But great, we know how, what this does. If we just shift down one of the h's by one. Everything that does is gives us a factor of ai. So here you might be worried that here is a sum over gamma, but actually always at most one of these delta functions at the same time is non-zero. So I can just focus on one term in the sum. Um, and then, then it goes on. And this just multiplies the original correlator. So that's the same. That's the v correlator. OK, and we actually also computed the next order. Then it starts to get non-trivial. But you see that uh, this is just the expansion of the covering map here, what's written here. 
So, and also this holds at the next order that here is just the covering map itself. Okay? So the, the small gamma is the field that if you insert it in a correlator, it just gives you the covering map back. It's kind of an interesting property. Um, okay, so. Sorry, I used the fact that. Yes, I use this solution to to compute. Right. So there's always at most one gamma at the same time for which this delta function cannot be zero. So if you give me all the xi's and zi's, there will be at most one gamma at the same time that is relevant. So if you move around the xi's and zi's, there will be suddenly other gammas here. Okay, so and you can do you, you can repeat the same trick with this d5 field, and what you find is that you can give a very similar expression than this one, and this is actually just the second derivative of gamma divided by d gamma times the original correlate. So this has also a property like this. So this again, I should stress, this is always only true if this constraint is true. So for because I'm using the solution. Okay, but now you see that we're in business because that means that classically, now I'm going back to my semi-classical interpretation, I should have that gamma of z as a classical field is gamma of z, the covering map. And d phi of z is this one, and let me write it as minus a half d log d gamma. Of course, I have the same thing also with d bar phi. I just repeat the same thing anti-holomorphically. So I can integrate it, and I see that phi should be minus a half log d gamma minus a half log d bar gamma bar plus the constant. So as promised, this is the constant I cannot fix by this argument. Um, but this is exactly this, the same equation as this one. Okay, so this is how we get on this equation. And why we see that this phi we can inter identify with the y factor. Okay, I think uh, I went over time. So from, from my, that's it from, from me. If you have questions, please.